Okay, thanks, Ben. I'm just making sure, first of all, everyone can hear me all right. Okay, so if I had known you were going to read out that long bio, Ben, I would have told you not to, but thank you anyway. Um, uh, it's always uh, a bit weird being, being a, a virtual speaker at these kind of events, but even more so uh, today when there's uh, so many good friends and colleagues in, in the room there, so I'm very sorry not to to be able to be to be with you there. I, I just want to say as well a big thanks to Rhiannon and Amina particularly and Polona and Mohammed and Carolyn, Stacey and Andrea and everyone there for, for all the organizing. Um, so um, my my topic yeah is is on apartheid it's really apartheid in Palestine and where that's come into the international legal institutions. Uh, I'm conscious Reem is maybe going to speak uh, to, on, along somewhat uh, similar themes as well so hopefully I won't preempt anything and we'll, we'll have a, a useful conversation afterwards but what I'll, 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 I'll uh, just try and give a little bit of an overview I mean like Israel um, fundamentally is an apartheid state as opposed to imposing an apartheid regime of racial dom domination throughout historic Palestine I think that's you know um, clear for, for any kind of serious anyone who's doing serious analysis of the Israeli state there has been something of an epiphany about this among some of the Western and, and liberal and, and Israeli human rights organizations in, in recent years, but it is important to say that this is like in no way a new development or some kind of aberration from you know what was a, a, a previously democratic state system that's temporarily gone gone awry. The like Israeli part that had been there since 1948, it's been baked into the constitution of the state and its, and its founding violence and, and structures and so much of Palestinian analysis has articulated that all along, has understood and, and conceptualized the situation of Palestinians as one of, of settler colonialism and, and alien, alien subjugation, as Shah had put it earlier, and, and apartheid is, the, is a kind of a legal and policy manifestation of, of settler colonialism essentially. And so if we, if when we talk about you know, the Israeli legal system, uh, its colonization and management of land and property, its citizenship and immigration border regimes, you know, putting all of those things together functions as an institutionalized system of, of racial domination, which is the, the definition of apartheid. And so like legal organizations like Adala have you know these very extensive databases of 65, 70, 75 racist Israeli laws that have been in place and built to accumulate over, over time since 1948. And the Palestinian kind of intellectual and activist tradition, you know, going all the way back to, to Fayyad and the, the PLO Research Center and the publications they were putting out in the 1950s and 60s talking about the system of racial domination, racial subjugation, the apartheid reality, uh, even, you know, prior to, to 1967. And Palestinians were very, you know, actively involved in various ways in the debates and discussions in the UN. Uh, around the uh, adoption of the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination in, in the 1960s, the Parker Convention in the 1970s, uh, all of that was kind of part of the context for developments in, in and third world agitation in the UN at the time, the, the UN resolution on, on Zionism as a form of racism in 1975, and the kind of general pattern of linking Israeli subjugation and domination of the Palestinians uh, with the apartheid regimes in southern Africa in a lot of UN documents and resolutions through through that period. And so that was you know very extensive analysis that was being done back then. Raji spoke this morning about you know post Oslo being there being this new brand of, of apartheid and there was that kind of ramping up of the, the settlement infrastructure, the increase increasingly kind of uh, bureaucratized permit regimes and land planning restrictions and all of that. And so in the wake of the kind of sham peace process of Oslo, then we had this revival and, and deepening of the anti-apartheid analysis, the anti-racist analysis in the Palestinian context with uh, like the Durban Group Conference in, in 2001 and some of the initiatives around that leading up to then the, the, the BDS call, the initiation of Israeli Apartheid Week and other kind of measures around 2005 and so on and so on. So all that just to say like that this isn't a you know some kind of recent threshold cross as, as human rights watch put it in the title of their reports it, you know in the wake of one big new development like the nation state law in, in 2018 or the moves towards more formalized annexation in the west bank or the intensification of some of the um incarceration and apartheid regime since since last october this has been a you know central feature of the palestinian reality and increasingly of the palestinian legal arguments over the past 25 years and so that we see it coming more and more in recent years into the international courts and 
tribunals and um, without trying to hold it up as, as any kind of um, panacea. Like I think there is, you know, some important elements of the apartheid analysis as a, as a legal um, category to, to emphasise. One is to do, you know, with questions of tactics and strategy and how and how the apartheid analysis links the legal um, legal actions and legal analysis with the wider social movements and civil society organisations and political campaigning that's been going on for a long time, that's one. The uh, second one is that it does allow for, in some ways, more of a structural and political analysis than some of the other legal categories. And so if we think about apartheid as that manifestation of settler colonialism with that common element of domination, how it ties into broader structures going back to the Nakba, to, to, to questions about the cleansing and ultimately the, the kind of logics of, of uh, elimination that we've seen in, in the last nine months, we we, we see the, a, a kind of a, a, a possibility for, for more of a, a deeper structure analysis than we have with some aspects of humanitarian law or human rights law, for example, and that's been, you know, uh, reiterated and emphasised a lot by, by Palestinian organisations over the last number of years. And then when it comes to the question of remedies, you know, there is also the potential for more holistic remedies, so I was at recently with, with um, Munir Musaber, who gave a paper on this, talking about, you know, the remedies for, for war crimes and even for, for genocide being more limited. And, you know, the reality is if, like, if the fighter jets were to stop to today or tomorrow, if the genocide of violence was to stop, if, you know, Israel was to stop, committing the type of war crimes that has been committed in, in, in Gaza, the apartheid system would remain in place. And so what the remedy that's required for um, ending the, the international wrong, international wrongful act of apartheid is a, a, a full and fundamental dismantling of the apartheid uh, system and regime. And so that you know, goes to every kind of legislative tool and mechanism of control that's part of that from the, from the land laws to the citizen suit and status laws, to you know the siege on Gaza itself, and so on. And so it's linked to self-determination and to decolonization fundamentally in that way. And you know, apparently the whole um, kind of origin story of the prohibition on apartheid in international law, obviously being tied to Southern Africa, is is linked fundamentally to the to the question of, of self-determination. And so you know, obviously, any international law or legal argument is not in itself going to be the same as or able to bring about national liberation uh, itself. You know, there are these questions of, of tactics and strategy and, and the, the role that law can play in relation to liberation movements or political movements. Uh, I, ha I have another piece with, with Nora Erica from a couple of years ago called We Charge Apartheid. But, you know, that anyone who's interested in these questions are happy to speak to them more uh, at the end as well in the discussion as well. But we, we kind of are trying to think through some of the the issues there, the possibilities for international law and for more expansive um, articulations of legal arguments at the ICC, at the ICJ, etc., how that can tie in with with um, with wider political arguments. But um, obviously, also there is a huge amount of, of limitations there that, that international law's own history pushes up against. And so, uh, just to maybe you know, since since the focus is on jurisprudence and the international courts and tribunals, just to touch on. Um, if I can, if I have time to do it, at least three, three of the institutions where apartheid arguments have been coming up, and it, it kind of reflects the diverse kind of uh, status in a way of apartheid in international law, which is one that's an internationally lawful wrongful act, which gives rise to state responsibility and has particular remedies there. It's also an international crime as a crime against humanity that gives rise to individual criminal responsibility, and it's kind of um, articulated also in the canon of, of human rights law. Through, through the CERT convention. And so that you know, leads to three different institutions being the CERT committee, the, um, the International Criminal Court, and the International Court of Justice. And so if I, if I can touch on each of them just briefly, the, the, the CERT committee, which is the UN committee responsible for overseeing the, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, going back to the 1980s, would have been making concluding observations about Israel, about racial discrimination and, and violations of the of the convention there and and building up to a uh, finding in 2012 that Israel was in violation not just of the kind of individual aspects of racial discrimination but also in violation of Article 3 which is the prohibition of, of segregation and apartheid and it kind of puts the two of them together. Uh, what uh, has happened since then is that Palestine has taken an interstate 
case against Israel under the, the Sarah Convention, one of the first cases of those types under the under the, the treaty, and there they're made, the Palestine is making a specific claim that, that Israel is um, not just violating Article 3 in general, but specifically has imposed an apartheid regime and has asked uh, for essentially you know, the, the remedy there being the, the full dismantle, dismantling of the settlements and the apartheid regime for third states not to uh, render any, any aid or, or, or assistance to the apartheid regime. And so you know, in theory, that does have you know, quite far-reaching implications for trade for arms exports, for sanctions, and diplomatic relations, and so on. It's within the human rights machinery of the UN system, which you know is limited in itself and has to, you know, for, for it to have any uh, traction, would have to make it make its way up through the, the higher kind of orders of the UN. But that case is is in the pipeline. I mean, there's a lot of frustration now about how, how slow it's, it's advanced. It was um, submitted in, in two, 20, 2018. There was a phase of two or three years of jurisdiction and admissibility phases, but there's it, it's gone into the full merit stage now. But it's still um, uh, still hasn't been finalised. And, and uh, specialists on on sort of like David Keane have been saying, you know, that the, the, the having passed six. Years that surely the, the reasonable time frame standards that the um, process talks about itself and some documentation has has been uh, exceeded, and so that, that there's a limitation there, obviously in how, how how it's moving, and there's also then the broader kind of limitation that we can't get away from that, like um, like uh, okay, five minutes plan perfect, yeah, thanks, just making sure we're that right, uh, that like. Um, it, like a lot of these, these institutions, their their mandate is limited to the 1967 occupied territories. That's a product of, of international laws, all kind of encouragement in the first place and acceptance of of the partition of Palestine. And so we have to be to be mindful of that as well. So that applies in, in relation to, to the third. It also applies in relation to the to the international court of justice and the, the advisory opinion that uh, Mohammed spoke about. I won't go into that in too much detail, but. Um, just to say, it was it, it's it's. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that today's it, it is it was 20 years ago today exactly that we had the first advisory opinion on the wall. 19 years ago then to this day that the, the BDS movement was formally launched in response to the lack of compliance with the original advisory opinion. And since then, basically for those last 19 years, we had these ongoing discussions about a second advisory opinion. John Dugard first raised it in his report in a special rapporteur in 2007 that there should be an advisory opinion on prolonged occupation, colonialism, and apartheid. It took a long time to get there, and even when it did get there, the question ultimately that went to the court was was more well, was more conservative, I suppose, than what Dugard had suggested 17 years ago, and that reflects really the conservatism of the Palestinian Authority and what they were willing to 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 push for. But you know, so it doesn't talk about apartheid in the question, but it does, as I have mentioned, to speak about discriminatory legislation and, and there's there's a way to, you know, for, for the apartheid arguments to come in to the case there. And of the kind of fifty odd states or international organizations that made submissions in this second advisory opinion proceedings, more than twenty of them did make the claim that, that Israel is imposing apartheid rule over the Palestinians and some states like Namibia have you know, focused their entire submission on that. That obviously has a particular relevance because of Namibia's own uh, history of subjection to occupation or extermination and, and South Africa itself as well also had a lengthy discussion of, of Israeli apartheid in its submission. There, we're going to have, uh, as Professor Chex alluded to, probably most likely the advisory opinion being rendered in the next couple of weeks but before the end of July and the summer break in the court and so but there is I think you know still a question mark over whether the you know how explicitly or how full on the, the ICJ will address any of those apartheid arguments uh, that were that were made. Um, apartheid did come up as the, as a context uh, in South Africa's case uh, against Israel under the Genocide Convention. Um, Victor Catan has written about that. Uh, you know, the, uh, as you know, it could be read as a kind of the genocide application could be read also as a kind of a phantom uh, argument about apartheid because of some of the structural connections and similarities between the definition of genocide and the definition of uh, apartheid. But I think you know it's unlikely that the ICJ will will deal with apartheid in in that case because the focus obviously is on on the genocide uh, convention. The Nicaragua against Germany case is potentially more interesting in that you know, that's primarily based on the Genocide Convention again, but does also you know, make arguments based on, on humanitarian law and other norms of general international law, including the prohibition of apartheid. So there is scope there 
uh, particularly you know the, the provisional measures uh, phase was, was more narrowly focused on, on weapons exports in the context of, of unfolding genocide uh, but there's scope potentially for Nicaragua there to focus more of its, of its arguments at the next phase of the proceedings on on apartheid in, in that case and again given rise to those um, to those third state uh, responsibilities thanks uh, Bania. Yeah. and so um, that's the International Court of Justice yeah we talked a bit about the duty to prevent genocide earlier there is also very clearly this duty to prevent you know the maintenance of the apartheid regime not to render aid or assistance in any way to the apartheid regime the UN was very strong in how it articulated that um, from 1970 to 1994 in, in relation to apartheid South Africa. Uh, the final piece then, I'll only have very uh, um, limited uh, time to say in the about this, but the, the International Criminal Court, and I know Chris Guinness is going to talk about this more anyway, but you know, there, there is this um, uh, reality that apartheid is a crime against humanity under the, the wrong statute. You will hear mainstream kind of international criminal lawyers and international humanitarian lawyers say that you know, part is not a real international crime, it was only included in the wrong statute as a kind of tokenistic measure to, you know, kind of get buy-in from some of the African states and so on, and that, you know, no rational prosecutor will will attempt to, to prosecute a part in that context. But I think, you know, the, the point that Bill made earlier about the Genocide Convention, you know, at, at some point itself being seen as not workable versus the reality of how it has been, you know, prosecuted once there was a will to do so is, is relevant there. And, and Raj mentioned all of the submissions, requests, and filings that have been done by the Palestinian organization since 2014, one of them in, in 2017 in particular, uh, did uh, have, have uh, the crime of apartheid in, included in it, and the, the Palestinian organizations, including um, Raj's organization, have been arguing for, for the need and the imperative for, for the apartheid to be to be included and, and you know there and I'll finish on this point, you know, I think there is, and this is what kind of the point we try and make in the We Charge Apartheid piece, that um, you know, there is scope there to, to push the boundaries to articulate a more expansive version of, of international law from a, a third world or a global south perspective, the idea of kind of going back to the to rethink the sources as, as Shahid was talking about and, and to agitate for a more transformative international law through the, the institutions and courts themselves as conservative or, or, or reluctant as they may be uh, to do so. The, what we see is, is the, the Palestinian activism pushing them uh, and in, you know, obviously now in, in the context of what we've seen in the last nine months there's, there's no excuse uh, for them not to, to do so. So I'll stop there and thanks very much.